same time and I'm struggling so I'm sorry that's when you learn the head bounce yes I, I'm not very good at that part so. I got the head bounce <laughs>
promise divine that never can fail. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises, Jesus is mine. Shadows around me, shadows above me, never can see. My Savior and God, He is the light, in Him is no darkness. Ever I'm walking close to the sun. Heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul in glory divine. Hallelujah, I am rejoicing, singing His praises. Jesus is mine in the bright sunlight, ever rejoicing, pressing my way to mansions above, singing his praises. Gladly I'm walking, walking in sunlight, sunlight of love, heavenly sunlight, heavenly sunlight, flooding my soul with glory divine. Jesus 
Somebody, somebody that can help me out here if I mess up playing guitar at least. Have your Bibles this morning, Luke chapter 8. As long as I told Rick the right information this morning, I think that was right. Oh, I did good, okay. We're going to look this morning at a familiar passage before we get into that though. Does anybody have a testimony or something they'd like to share this morning before we... Get into the Word. Anybody? Sometimes it's not the physical distance 
Amen. Thank you, Mike. Anybody else this morning? Well, I just want to say how thankful I am for each and every one of you. I don't always do a good job of showing that, so I do apologize for that. But we do appreciate each and every one of you and, and what you've meant to us and all these years, not just as uh, since we've been here as your pastor, but even when I was here as a young minister filling in and uh, the way we were treated uh, that so many years ago meant a lot to us. What, what was it, Emily, 2016 we were down here? I'd only been preaching two years and I was down here, I think, almost six months helping out and just... Uh, I just felt a lot of love then and, and still now. So we just appreciate you guys very much. And um, we're thankful for, for everything you guys do for us. So um, anything else from anybody? we got started. But trying to be better about this part because we don't do this part as well as I would like. But uh, So this morning we're going to look at a familiar passage. Uh, many of us have read these verses either in the book of Matthew or in the book of, of Luke um, of this Mine's titled, A Girl Restored and a Woman Healed. Um, so there's two different miracles that happen in this short group of scriptures today. And the question I, I have, um, do we as a church still believe in miracles? I think most of us do, but I don't think we believe in them the same way that they happened in the Bible so often. Uh, I, I believe that if Jesus and, and, and God is the great physician or in it, it doesn't matter if it's to our liking or not. They can do it the way they desire to, Right? Whether it's three years down the road or it's three minutes down the road, uh, I, I believe that they have complete power to do any miracle that they have. But today we live in a world of complete unbelief in the power and the authority of God. They don't only, only disbelieve in the power of God, but his authority to set things in motion. I, I believe without a shadow of a doubt that God will use Satan for his glory. And I've been looked at like I'm crazy when I've said that to people before, but the reality is Satan may be the ruler of this world, but he only acts in the power that God has allowed him to have. And I want you to think about that. Satan works in this world to get our attention, right? To make us aware that bad things still happen each and every day. But just like in the book of Job, he had to go to God to ask for permission, right? To get Job down, to beat Job up, Job up and do all the things that he did to him. So we, we get in the moment and these things happen and this, these two stories are very uh, much in that same way. We've, we've not believed that God can actually do it until we read scripture like this today. So we live in a world though that would rather disbelieve. But they would rather believe in anything but God. They, they would rather believe that the world started out of a big bang and that's how it began than believe that God set it in motion when he spoke it into existence. Emily, uh, there's a book that Emily loves. It's a kid's book, okay? It's called Creation, and it talks about creation and how it simplifies it for kids, of course. But we've made it so complicated because the world would disagree with what the Bible would have to say about it. But that's the world we live in today. If the Bible says it, they're against it, period, okay? And the day is coming when nobody, we talked about this a few weeks ago, nobody will listen to sound doctrine. We're living in those days, whether we want to believe it or not, there are people today that will not listen to sound doctrine. They will not listen that Jesus is Lord and he will be Lord of Lords and King of Kings when he comes back. They would rather us be silent about the power of God. I, I think of this football player that had this cardiac problem on the football field. It wasn't too many months ago we, went, we, didn't, we were kneeling for the flag, right? It wasn't too long ago that we didn't want God spoken of at a football game. But by gosh, if something happens on that field, we go straight to prayer. And it's great, don't get me wrong. But where, what are we doing the other times of the year? We, we all fall into this trap. Whether we want to believe it or not, I, I believe this woman who had been with this problem for 12 years had, was about to give up all hope except for Jesus. And we so often do the same thing. In times of tragedy, we go to God. But when good things are going on, God's on the back burner. So I, I don't, this isn't my sermons from the last couple weeks, and uh, I, I was telling Rick this morning I felt very negative the last couple of weeks, so I do apologize, but that was the leading that I had on my, my heart. But this morning, I want us to look at this and look at the story in its ty- entirety and not skip bits and pieces and say, well, a great miracle happened. It did, but there's a reason. So if you would stand with me this morning, Luke chapter 8, we're going to start in verse 40. Uh, we're going to read a, a, a little bit longer passage this morning, so bear with me. Again, Luke 8 and 40. 
When Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Just then a man named Jairus, and I'll pronounce his name wrong two or three times, so I'm sorry, came. He was a leader of the synagogue. He fell down at Jesus' feet and pleaded with him to come to his house because he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, and she was dying. When he was going, the crowds were nearly crushing him. A woman suffering from bleeding for 12 years, who had spent all of all she had on doctors and yet could not be healed by any, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. Instantly, her bleeding stopped. Who touched me, Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds are hemming you in and pressing against you. Someone did touch me, said Jesus. I know that power has gone out from me. When the woman saw that she was discovered, she came trembling and fell down before him. In the presence of all the people, she declared the reason she had touched him. And how she was instantly healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone came from the synagogue leader's house and said, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. When Jesus heard it, he answered him, don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be saved. After he came to the house, he let no one enter with him except Peter, John, James, and the child's father and mother. Everyone was crying and mourning her. But he said, stop crying because she is not dead but asleep. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead. So he took her by the hand and called out, child, get up. Her spirit returned and she got up at once. Then he gave orders that she be given something to eat. Her parents were astonished, but he instructed them to tell no one what had happened. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, as we just come to you this morning, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we can open it and see the many miracles and great things you did in the past god but that you're still doing today god i ask that you would just enlighten us this morning help us to see your word not just on words on a page god not just as a book but god as a living being in our lives help us to follow you closer each and every day god god i ask you forgive us we fail you clear our hearts and our minds so this morning of all of the problems god that we can focus on you we ask all this in the name of jesus and amen So again, if I pronounce a name wrong, you can correct me. It's all right. Because uh, I will pronounce it wrong 15 more times. So if we look in the, in the scripture and we look in, in the book of Matthew, and, and the woman, it's no accident here that you have a woman who's been struggling for 12 years and you have a 12-year-old girl. Okay, Numbers are important in the Bible whether we understand them or not. But it was no accident that both of these individuals' lifespan and their problems weren't much different. Okay? So we look at a a 12-year-old little girl and a woman who'd been struggling for 12 years, okay? We we see the one so often in the world we live in today maybe is more important than the other. But so often we want to say, well, the the child needs to save first. But you know what they do on an airplane in an an emergency? They tell the parents to put their oxygen on first. You know why? Because if they don't, their kid can't help them, right? But they can help their child. So, so often we put that on the back burner, though, and we say, well, we've got to save the little kids first. And, and don't get me wrong, okay? I want to save the little kids as much as we can. But just like that plane, there's a purpose for why the parent is taken care of first in that instance, right? So we look at this story, though, and we can say that she had been sick for some time. He said because he had his only daughter, about 12, and she was dying. So it was no ifs, ands, or buts, she was sick. Uh, but in, in Matthew's account... This is what he says in verse 18. And he was telling him, he's saying, suddenly one of the leaders came and knelt down before him saying, my daughter just died. So, so we have two different accounts, okay? We have the account of Luke that says that he came to Jesus while he was, she was still yet alive, right? Said that she was dying. And, but Matthew's account from a different perspective, this is where uh, it's so important to realize that the gospels are so much different, even though they're the same. The eye account witness takes a different perspective and he says that she was already dead, right? We, we can look at that and say, well, it's, it's, it's differing opinion. No, it's not. It's the same scripture, it's just a different point, point of view, okay? If we were to play the telephone game, anybody ever played telephone? First person starts it, right? They get the original story. You think you get the original story if you're the 15th person in line? No. <laughs> you're getting some story out of left field that has bits and pieces, right? Right? of the original but that's why we have the the 
four Gospels to compare against each other and say, hey, well, Matthew saw it this way, okay? But he came to her and he came to Jesus and said that she's dead, right? So Jesus and his disciples got up and followed him. So we, we can look at both of these and it says that Jesus was on his way to do this miracle, right? He knew what his plan was, but this woman came along and touched him. We have to remind ourselves like Jesus we as Christians, people see that. At, at work, I can't openly talk about Christianity all the time, okay? Because there's people that get offended. Does that mean that I keep my mouth shut? No, not very well. Just be honest. But you know what happens in times of tragedy when you work in a place and they know you're a Christian? They come to you and say, hey, will you pray for me? Hey, I'm struggling with this. Will you help me? We, we're the light. Whether we, we understand that fully or not, we've been given the opportunity to be the light just as Jesus was. This woman, if you read Matthew's account, it reads a little different. She had suffered from bleeding, verse 20, for 12 years, approached from behind and touched the end of his robe. For she said to herself, if I just touch his robe, I'll be made well. She, she believed without a shadow of a doubt, if I could just touch his robe. Not even Jesus himself. Just the clothing that he had on, that she would be healed. The power of God today is that healing still occurs, but our faith is not like this woman. We, we, we want God to answer immediately, right? This woman had been struggling for 12 years. Was Jesus alive all those 12 years? Yeah. He's in his ministry at this point. He's in his late 20s, early 30s, right? He's been alive for all this time, but he wasn't the great teacher until he started his, his ministry here on earth. He was learning all these years. But, but she had the faith, if I just touch him, Church, if we would have that faith that if we just show up to church and we take God with us, that he would move us each and every day, how much different would the world we live in be? How, how much different would it be if we would just think about it, right? I was reading a, a book I've, I've talked about here the last few weeks, and it, it was, it's called a fiction story, okay? It's all based on, a, on true thing, facts that were found from the Bible that compared to 9-11. And there was something I did not know did not think of, I guess, that George Washington was inaugurated as president, not in 1776, but in 1789, right, in New York City. So think about that for a minute. Not Washington, D.C., New York City, okay? And, and they, after his inauguration, and I did actually research this some more, they went to a church and prayed for their country, prayed for the country that they were leading, that God would be in the middle of it, Right? And that church is on the opposite corner of where the World Trade Centers were. I want you to think there's no accident, okay, in, in the world today. That church was there before 9-11, before the World Trade Centers. And the author of this book compared the fall of the World Trade Centers, the fall of America to start, as the fall of Israel. What happened to Israel at the beginning of its fall? Its walls fell down, Right? You know what the World Trade Centers represented? Represented the, the, the country's wealth. It represented the money that we had, right? So when those buildings were taken away, our money didn't just go out the wazoo, but there were some things that happened, and I'm not going to get into all of it this morning, but it's no accident that the preparations for our country were laid right there and that God used a bad thing to wake us up, no offense, in 9-11. I think 9-11 was... I don't think it was planned by our government, as people have said, I'm sure, for the last two decades. I, I don't believe that it was something the country wanted, but I believe it was God's wake-up call to each and every one of us. This, this woman is like each and every one of us. She'd struggled for 12 years. I, I, I'm sure she prayed to God. I don't know the answer to that. But she had faith to believe that Jesus was the great physician. But it said in, in Luke She'd spent all of her money on doctors. She'd spent everything she had to figure out why she was having this problem and how to fix it. And it took one person coming into her life to change it. Church, we think we can change ourselves. We think if we make a New Year's resolution or a goal or whatever you want to call it. I don't like resolutions. I make goals. That's what I've always said. Right? But we can make those goals all we want. But I can't make myself do it. Right? I can't clean myself up just like becoming a Christian. I, I can try to better myself, but guess what? If I'm doing it on my own, I'm going to fall back into the same pit. This, this woman had been doing it on her own for 12 years. She'd been looking for help, right? 
but it took one instance to change your life. We can look at any scripture, uh, many scriptures in the Bible and see that it just took one instance to change somebody's life. Peter was called out of a fishing boat, right? Jesus said, come, come with me and you'll fish for men. You'll, you'll, you'll be fishing for people. What, they didn't, do you think Peter understood that? I don't know if he fully understood that, right? He knew it was different than fishing for fish, though. But we look at scripture and we see that Things changed in an instance. It said that it approached him from behind and touched the end of his robe. She didn't confront Jesus. She didn't get in front of him to get his attention. She just walked up behind him and reached out. The world is, listen to me, Christian, the world is coming up behind us and reaching out for something that they don't understand. They don't have. Do we understand the gift that we've been given because of the salvation that Jesus offered us just like this woman when Jesus changed our lives, guess what? Your home was an eternity from that point. Not at baptism, not, not at church membership. At the moment you accepted Jesus Christ, if you died in the next instance, guess what? You were going to spend eternity with Jesus. You were that close to hell, but you spend eternity with Jesus yet the same. This woman was suffering. She'd been having her problems. And if you remember in Scripture, this would have made her ceremonial unclean. She wasn't clean because of this bleeding that she'd had for 12 years. What did you have to be each and every year before Jesus came? You had to be cleaned up, right? You had to be cleaned up. She couldn't worship. She couldn't go to the temple. She couldn't have contact with people. But on this day, she didn't care anymore. And she met with Jesus face to face. But what did Jesus say to her? He didn't rebuke her. He didn't say anything. He just simply said, who touched me? In verse 22 of Matthew 8, Jesus turned and saw her. Have courage, daughter. Your faith has saved you. So a little bit different again. But Jesus asked the question according to Luke, who touched me? And the disciples, who, who, who speaks up? Who speaks up there? Peter, right? Big mouth Peter. <laughs> well, well, Jesus, they're all like right around you. How's somebody not touching you, right? He, he's missed the whole point. Jesus realized that other people were touching him, right? But what did he continue to say? He said this. Someone did touch me. I know that power has gone out for me. Jesus knew the amount of power that he was carrying around, and he knew when some of it was gone from him. We serve an all-knowing God. And Jesus, as God incarnate, was 100% man and 100% God. And he felt the power leave him. Because this woman did not just come and touch him like everybody else was. She came in faith, knowing that he was the only one to save her. Church, we are the light of the world. I've said this. I'm going to say it till I'm blue in the face. People should be able to come to us and get filled up with Jesus. I'm not telling you you're going to have all the answers. I'm not telling you you're going to have the power of Jesus Christ because we do not, okay? But I also know that there is a spirit that lives inside of each and every one of us if we've accepted Jesus. A spirit that is not your conscience, as finding uh, Nemo would say to Dory as they're swimming in the dark waters. I'm your conscience. We haven't talked in a while, right? That's not the way the Holy Spirit works. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, that's not the way it works. But this woman, she was afraid. She, she didn't know what to do, and it says that she came trembling and fell down before him in the presence of the people. She declared the reason she had touched him, and now she was instantly healed. It's no accident. She, again, says instantly. At that very moment, she was changed from the inside out. If we believe that Jesus died on a cross and that he gave his life for each and every one of us and we've accepted him in our lives, you should be different than when you became a Christian. Does that mean you're not going to fall short? No, I fall short every day in my life. I've been a Christian almost 20 years. I've been a Christian longer in my life than I've been not a Christian, okay? That's never going to change. But the reality is we get so focused on the wrong things that we forget that Jesus said we're to be the light. We're not to hide our light. We're not to put it under a basket. We're not to say, well, like Peter did, I don't really know that Jesus guy. No, 
We're supposed to say without a shadow of a doubt that he healed us instantly and we have a home in glory land. We get to the, the next part and I can imagine this, this father waiting, probably not very patiently, for Jesus to come and heal his daughter, right? I want you to think about this, Christian. This is how God works. We ask him for something, right? And something else comes along and God might do that first. And we'll go, well, God, I asked you for this before that. Why are you doing this? Because God wanted to prove a point yet again. Not only did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, he raised this little girl from the dead in his earthly ministry. Now, both of those people, Lazarus and this little girl, died again to this world. Jesus died once and for all, that was it. But Lazarus and this little girl had to experience death twice. No thank you, okay? I don't know that I want to experience it twice, right? I, I think of uh, the book and the movie called 90 Minutes in Heaven. A, a pastor, he died and he went to heaven for 90 minutes. He believes this without a shadow of a doubt. If you've read the book or seen the movie, it's very, very hard not to believe it when he, when he talks about it. But he literally died and went to an eternity with Jesus for 90 minutes. Would you want to come back after being in eternity with Jesus for 90 minutes? I wouldn't. I'm just going to be real honest. I love my wife. I love my kids. I love my family. But if God called me home, I'd have a hard time coming back. That's the world that we live in today. We shouldn't seek tomorrow. We should be seeking when Jesus comes back. You know, we, we say we don't want to prepare too far ahead. I've never heard that in any business except everyone I've worked at. We don't want to look too far ahead. We want to prepare for, for just this week, right? I don't know about you, but I'm preparing a home in eternity today. I'm not waiting until I go there. The, the, this, this father, had, he, he had love for his daughter. He didn't want her to die on this earth. But a little later, your daughter is dead. Don't bother the teacher anymore. That's the faith of the people in the community. She's dead. The teacher can't do nothing for her. Church, Jesus washed us of our deadness when he died on the cross for our sins. There's only one person that can do that. And it's the one who died on the cross for our sins. I was dead in my transgressions before Jesus. Amen? I was dying and going to hell. We, we were talking about the, the man that got saved at, at Central. And Kima made the comment. He went into eternity smelling like hell. Because he was that close to dying and going to hell. But Jesus still saved him. Right? We, we can look at all these different stories and say, well, they're just stories. No, Jesus wasn't bothered to go and talk to this little girl. He wasn't bothered to go raise her. He wanted to, right? We as Christians must have a desire to want to help people. When Jesus heard this, he answered, don't be afraid. Only believe and she will be saved. We, we, may, we have made, I'm going I'm to get down here for a minute so I get off my soapbox, okay? We have made Christianity hard. Jesus just said it. Only believe and she'll be saved. That's all we have to do to lead people to Jesus. We've got to tell them who Jesus is, right? Not who he was, who he is still today. But we also have to tell them that you just have to believe. You, you don't have to make it hard. You don't have to, to get, sa get baptized just to, to be saved. No. The, the church today, we've, we've convoluted how you get saved. You get saved because Jesus did the work. And all you have to do is believe that he did it. Amen? We, we've complicated it. Just like, this, just like this, this father. I'm sure he wept at the time that, that he was told that he didn't need to bother Jesus anymore. I'm sure he was very upset that his daughter was dead. But Jesus just reassures him, hey, don't, don't be afraid. Just believe. You came to me in believing. Don't leave without believing, right? I know people that I struggle with. I had a teacher in college. And I could not tell you his name. That's how important it was, I guess. He taught world religion. And he was a devout atheist who used to be a youth pastor in the Christian church. If you can add that one up, please let me know. Okay, I haven't been able to add that up. I don't know how anybody can come to Jesus and a few years down the road go, well, I don't believe in that Jesus guy anymore. I'm 28 years old. I've seen Jesus work, though. I've seen him work in my life. I've seen him work in the lives of others. It, there's, too many, there's too many things that have happened for me not to believe in who he is. 
Yet the world would still say that he was just a person who died on a cross. So they get there. He came in verse 51 to the house. And he let no one in except for Peter, John's and John, and James. And the child's mother and father. And it said everyone was crying and mourning for her. But he said stop crying because she is not dead but asleep. Jesus knew that he had all the authority to raise that girl from the dead. I believe she was dead, okay? Jesus said she was asleep just to make a point, okay? I believe that. What's the next verse say? I don't know what the King James says, but mine says they laughed at him. They laughed in Jesus' face because he said, but she's just asleep. They laughed at Jesus. Guess what? They're going to laugh at you and me. They're, they're going to laugh at what we believe. Why? Because they don't understand it. But I'm telling you right now, Jesus, it didn't stop Jesus from saving that little girl just because they laughed at him. And church, it shouldn't stop us from sharing the gospel just because the world might not like it. They may think it's a joke. They may be hateful about it. But it, if it didn't stop Jesus, and Jesus is, guess what, the author of our salvation, it shouldn't stop us today. They laughed at him because they knew she was dead and he took her by the hand and he called out, child, get up. And it says that her spirit returned and she got up at once. Immediately, she was healed. We, ha we serve a God who works in his timing, right? He, I, I believe that he didn't have to go to the house to save that little girl. I think he could have done it right there when the father came to him. But the power of God is not to just, oh, well, hey, it's done. Poof, a genie, right? I believe he could have done it while the father was there. But he waited until they could be there in person with that little girl and see her body restored. Her spirit returned to her at once. We've complicated that so much to say, well, I don't think it really happened instantly. I do. I believe when Jesus died on a cross, it was instantly that the veil was torn from the top to the bottom. I believe that when he rose from the grave on the third day, it was instant that our sins were carried away. It was no, oh, well, you've got to wait 10 years for that to happen, right? No, it was immediately salvation came. Immediately for these two people that we see in Scripture, they were saved. Can you imagine, though, the family and those who laughed at Jesus? <laughs> Can you imagine how they felt after laughing about it? Holy cow, we were wrong, right? Right? The world today needs to understand something, Christian. They're not right. They're not serving the right master, right? We, we, we can talk about it till we're blue in the face, but we have been called to be the light. We must be faithful in little. We must be faithful in much. We, we must be ready in season and out of season. Not just when we're feeling like it. I, I talked about it last week, it's not a light switch. Being a Christian is not a light switch. You get to turn on and off when you're having a bad day. You're, you're a Christian every day once you've accepted Jesus Christ. Follower of Christ is what a Christian is. You're following the example set by Jesus. Jesus never set his cross down and said, well, God, I'm not going to do this today. He may have prayed that God to take the cup from him, but what did he say? This is where people take this out of context. Well, Jesus prayed that for God to not make him go to the cross. Yeah, he did. But the rest of the sentence says, but not my will be done, but yours. Church, we, we cannot continue to serve ourselves. We cannot continue to say, well, what's in it for me? What's in it for you is salvation. You've already got it, though, as a Christian. What's in it for you is a home in eternity that you haven't seen yet, but you're going to. That's what's in it for us, the Christian, today. That's why we lead people to Jesus. I believe that our reward in heaven is based on what we did on this earth. I believe everybody who's a Christian has a home. I believe every home is a little different based on what they did. We used to make the joke, the Cubs fan and the Cardinals fan went to heaven. The Cubs fan lived in the little shack and the Cardinals fan lived on the mansion on the hilltop. I don't think it's going to be like that, okay? I don't think God has a favorite ball team. If he did, it'd be the Cardinals, but I don't think he does, okay? <laughs> the reality, though, is that that's how we view it. We think it's our status on this earth that gets us a home in eternity. It has nothing to do with our social status. It has everything to do with what we're willing to do for Jesus while we walk this earth. Are you going to fall short? Yeah. Are you going to make mistakes? Yep, every day. 
but the disciples did, and they were martyred for the faith. So guess what? That they were faithful. <laughs> they may have had their shortcomings, but Jesus still used them in a mighty way. I'm going to ask that you stand. I'm going to ask that Sheila to come. So they were astonished, though, and Jesus told them to tell no one. Why would, why would Jesus tell them not to? Tony Evans said this, because of this formal acknowledgement of his Messiahship awaited his entry into Jerusalem. He could not, he didn't want to unveil the Messiah part yet, right? He, he knew that he'd saved this girl, he wanted them to know that, but it wasn't yet time for them to share that with the world. There's no limit today. God's not telling you to wait to share the, the gospel. I don't know about anybody else, I've told this story before when I was in third grade and I got saved, all I wanted to do was tell everybody else about Jesus. And somewhere along the way, between 8 and 28, I've lost that. I'm regaining it now, but we lost that desire somewhere in our childlike faith. As we grew up, we forgot that God still saved us for a purpose. Every single one of us has a purpose. I've said that. I believe that. We all have the ability, though, to open the book to get the answer. I can't tell you your, your role in this life. I don't know the answer for you. I barely know the answer for myself some days. And I have to go to God and I have to ask him, God, what's your plan for me? God had a plan for these two individuals that he saved in the word. It wasn't just some woman. It wasn't just some little girl to Jesus. He knew him by name. He knew the hairs on their head. He, he knew everything they were going to be. And he saved them for a purpose. That he would get the glory. Not that they would get it. Not that she would just raise from the dead and be, oh, well, look what she did. No, that Jesus would do it. God is still in control of this world today. But we have to be mindful that we've got to seek him each and every day still. Heavenly Father, God, as we just come to you this morning, God, we thank you for your presence. God, we thank you for the many miracles that you did then, God, in the Bible, but also today in our lives. God, we know that you are still the great physician. You're still the great healer. You're still the savior of the world today. Even in our shortcomings as Christians, even in the world's disobedience of you, God, you are still in love with, you, with each and every one of us, God. God, I pray that those here this morning would feel your presence, God, in their lives. They'd feel your love, God, but they'd also feel the burden for those around them. God, I ask that you help us to share the gospel with somebody. That you help us to Show somebody the love and compassion that you showed us in our weakest hour, God. Boy, while we were still yet sinners, you died for us, God, and I thank you for that. God, I ask in this time of invitation, God, if there's one that doesn't know you this morning, that today would be the day. God, if there's one today that sees their shortcomings, God, and they want to turn it over to you, God, I ask that you would help each and every one of us to realize that. God, that you would help each of us to seek your face more and more each day. We pray for all those that were mentioned earlier today, God, and there are many needs. And God, I ask also in this time of invitation, if there's a need here, God, whatever it is, salvation, baptism, membership, God, just a, a pain point in life, God, that we'd be willing to turn it over to you on this altar this morning. God, I ask that you continue to be with us. Forgive us, we fail you. In Jesus' name, and amen.